Um, kia ora koutou, uh, call Mark Neil Toko Ingoa. Um, I'm a strategic lead at um, Dairy NZ. Uh, yeah, so, and I'll be talking to you about uh, resilience and adaptation of farm systems in a changing climate. Um, pastoral agriculture um, uh, will be the focus and some of the examples will come from dairy, but I'll, I think a number of these lessons um, uh, and experiences will carry over. Um, so yeah, I'm involved in um, uh, climate change as part of my area of work, um, both mitigation and adaptation, and uh, also covering research, uh, policy and strategy. Um, and uh, yeah, previously been involved in my uh, in previous roles in economic modelling and farm systems. So um, this this stuff is um, uh, is it's good stuff. It's uh, my bread and butter. So. Um, the climate is changing. I don't think we'd um, have many arguments about that. Um, and so what we, what we farm, we need to be regionally resilient. And what that means is going to be different in different regions. Uh, but because in particular our pastoral industries are export oriented, we need to be internationally competitive. So that puts an envelope around the revenues and costs that we can um, uh, expect to have and to use to manage um, to manage how we do this uh, adaptation. So, what does climate change um, look like? Um, so, we know we've got increasing CO2. We know we're going to have increasing um, temperatures as a result of that. Um, the graph on the right. I'm sure you've all seen a million um, pictures like this. Uh, this one in particular, um, days over 25 degrees on a business as usual um, projection. And by the end of the century, um, you know, we're heading up to, you know, basically the equivalent of three months over 25 degrees, which um, might be pleasant for um, uh, Australians, for example. Um, that's, uh, that's just starting to, starting to warm up and get into attractive space. But uh, cows um, and other ruminants, their uh, thermoneutral zone is lower than that for a person. So they're starting to be affected by heat earlier than us. And um, pastures as well will be affected um, before um, it gets out of what's, what we think of as comfortable um, and uh, convenient beach weather. Um, changing average rainfall. And that average rainfall, uh, again, what that means in different places will be different. Um, but the variability uh, season to season, so uh, if it's a wetter winter, that doesn't help you out so much. Um, and a drier summer, the average maybe hasn't changed that much, but the pattern is really not useful um, for pastoral agriculture. And then year to year, if the variability increases, um, that's also a problem. Um, and then obviously extremes, um, and we can, um, uh, we can think about uh, Gabrielle as an example, um, not unprecedented. Um, we saw some amazing pictures in one of the master classes on um, uh, you know, the pictures that look very similar to Bowler. Uh, but if you ask the question, do we think it's going to be as long between Bowler and Gabrielle and Gabrielle to the next thing? Um, plausibly, um, that's going to come around um, more quickly. And so all these things are going to have effect on pasture, they're going to have effect on animals, and they're going to affect um, systems. So what have we seen up till now? So what, where's some real data? So at um, Dairy NZ we have dairy-based data, so it's collecting lots of individual farm data going back, um, uh, yeah, basically 20 years. Uh, so. Um, uh, one, of the, one of our guys, Ryan Mills, and I pulled out some data for a grasslands paper and we looked at um, uh, Northland and Waikato and uh, I've just re-looked at the data again. Um, there's another three years since we did this um, and the decline looks like half a tonne of dry matter per decade. So half a tonne of dry matter is, is quite a lot. So um, in Northland, the average pasture harvest is about nine tonnes, so half a tonne off that is a substantial reduction. And Waikato is about 12 tonnes, um, a smaller percentage, but still a substantial reduction. Um, and you think, okay, well maybe there's other places where it's getting warmer, 
increased CO2 that um, should be getting benefits out of this, Canterbury Southland, um, we're not seeing that in the data. Um, so yeah, in summary, even up till now, um, the genetic progress in pastures and management is not really keeping up to the um, challenge, um, the pace at which uh, climate is, um, is changing. Um, so, I'm sorry, I should tell you, if you're coming for good news, you've probably come to the wrong place. Probably just go to the pub, just go to the pub now. Um, so, uh, pasture persistence. So, um, ryegrass, which is what, uh, you know, the grass species that a lot of our pastoral agriculture is built on, an amazing plant, high quality, grows well in general. Um, uh, it's uh, reasonably resilient to sub-optimal management, um, is a polite way of putting it. Um, uh, but it has, uh, it has to last and so in the Upper North Island, you know, we, we know there's pasture persistence problems um, and uh, so we did, did some modelling and so what we considered is, um, uh, you know, how many years until it gets to about 50% coverage um, uh, it, and that's, that's when it's ru running out. So, um, uh, you know, less than two and a half years is in red, and so you can see some red, <coughs> excuse me, and um, as we go from mid-century to late century, you know, we're seeing a lot more red. Um, uh, so that puts a cost onto uh, farmers, or, you know, do we have to re-sow? Um, do we have to introduce other species? Um, and what... Um, and whenever you're doing more operations with the soil, you know, you're um, losing soil carbon, you're um, adding greenhouse gases in terms of machinery, the cost of the time, the cost of the seed. Um, no, one, no one wants to have to deal with lower pasture persistence, um, but it's, it's, it's not improving. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a problem. Um, in terms of the cows, um, this is um, a, uh, just a map here of um, projected milk solids losses um, by the end of the century. And while that's only 2.5% of milk solids, you know, 2.5% of milk solids, that last milk solids is quite profitable, so it's probably 5% of earnings before interest and tax. And then you take out interest and tax, and it's probably more like 10%. So anyone that thinks that 10% of their after-tax profit isn't much, um, could you please hook me up for a loan? Um, the um, but uh, months where we think um, traditionally are not a problem, April and November, projected to go under BAU from 10 to 30 days of heat stress, and then May and October going from zero up to 20 by end century. So that's a substantial change in um, uh, what cows are going to experience out in the paddock. <coughs> um, okay, so what does that look like in a system? So um, if we just look at the left here to start with, so the um, animal demand is the uh, red line and then the pasture supply is the blue line um, by month. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the deficit now is about um, one and a half tonnes, okay? And so you make a bit of silage in spring, you bring in some supplements, and that's a gap that you can fill and manage and um, work around. But then by mid-century, um, we've seen a small increase in winter and early spring growth, um, but the deficit going through into summer um, is really starting to blow out over two tonnes. And then by late century, you know, this is three plus tonnes. This is not, uh, not a happy place to be. So you're going to have to uh, think about, you know, what are the adaptations you put in place, stocking rate, you know, maybe calving date a little bit earlier. Do you want to introduce cropping? Um, you know, um, maybe not really for some of the reasons I talked about before, uh, but maybe diverse pastures or diverse species <coughs> might, um, might help mitigate some of this, um, uh, some of these losses. Um, and uh, I guess as a cautionary tale, what are things that we want to learn from other people that are um, maybe, you know, 30 to 50 years ahead of us in the uh, experiencing some of this? 
So Australia, uh, here we've got a graph of um, uh, annual milk production. And up until the late 90s, New Zealand and Australia were tracking about the same. And yes, there's differences between Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, but from that point, Australia's been on a steady uh, downward trajectory. Um, and so New Zealand has you know, continued to grow and got to a point where we're largely static. Um, but what does, the, what does the way forward look like um, for us? Um, can we maintain that um, or you know, how hard do we have to work to um, ensure that we don't have the decline we've experienced there? Um, so that's most of the um, uh, doom and gloom. Um, well, what are, we, what are we going to do about it? So some of the things that um, are in place now, like the breeding worth index, that's breeding, uh, that's breeding animals for their performance at the moment. And um, as, this, as the climate becomes more challenging, you know, we are um, adjusting the animal. Um, that's incremental. Um, genetics, so uh, LIC, for example, have got a, uh, found a gene, the slick gene, that um, confers heat tolerance onto animals. Um, they've just recently pulled up some experiments where it hasn't negatively affected cold tolerance. So that's um, arguably something we should be looking at, how we integrate that. And then management. What are the things you can do on farm, whether it's, you know, change milking frequency, adding shade or uh, shelter into the system um, to help with that um, adaptation. Um, in terms of um, forages and systems, so uh, we have a forage value index that attempts to do the same sort of thing for forages that we do for animals primarily ryegrass based at the moment and persistence is a trait that we're uh, that we're looking at there um, and certainly um, we need to put more emphasis on that uh, an SFF project that um, uh, got funded and announced uh, this year the pasture accelerator which is how we measure these pastures more accurately more cost effectively to enable you know genomics and speed up the rate of progress that we have in pasture um, because it is a slow, you know, from when you have a new um, cultivar through to when it's released, it's slow at the moment. So if we can cut that uh, iterative process by a few years, that'll be extremely helpful. And then something I'll talk about a bit more, um, the Resilient Pastures Program, that's an SFF um, uh, project that we're, that we're pulling together at the moment uh, to hopefully get funded. And that was uh, doing work in Northland, Tetai Tokoro, um, where you know, they're at the pointy end of climate change. So solutions, they need solutions that work for them now, um, but the solutions that work for them now will be the solutions that other places that are challenged um, will be able to use in the future as well. So it's got real national relevance. So, um, uh, so there's some of the funders. So it's cross-sectoral, um, dairy, sheep and beef. And the vision there is uh, resilient climate adapted pastures across Aotearoa that enable a sustainable and prosperous future for pastoral farming in rural communities. Um, so it's got uh, quite a wide um, lens on what the problem is in terms of um, you know, farm system resilience, helping farmers with the confidence that the solutions that they're going to put in place will work and ensuring that we've got environmental sustainability and help them on that change journey. Um, uh, four work streams in that, so climate modelling. Um, we need to understand about what are the, what's, what's the climate, what are we going to have to adapt to and when, how quickly is it coming at, at us. The forage options, and so there's a full range of uh, pasture species that will be looked at in terms of uh, how can they help us. Um, and then the farm system optimization, which is how do we take these um, alternative species and integrate them into a system that works. And uh, then the uh, fourth work stream there, adoption. You know, how do we work, um, work with farmers to, uh, you know, as part of the co-development process and you know, help enable that change at scale. Um, yeah, so that's that uh, project that we're really hoping to um, uh, get over the line and get started on that um, next year. But if, uh, if I was going to give you take home messages, we need both mitigation and adaptation. So we want to reduce our greenhouse gases um, 
New Zealand by itself, that it's not going to make a huge dent into the global, um, uh, global emissions, but I'd like to think that the solutions that we develop are also going to be applicable to a lot of the rest of the world um, that is using ruminants and um, pastoral-based ruminants. Um, so yes, show, uh, show me the money. I need the money for both. Um, uh, in the long run, um, most of the pastoral sectors are going to be negatively affected. Um, uh, who's here from Southland? Yeah, you've got 50 years. Uh, you know, um, and uh, support and engage with adaptation projects. So um, yeah, if you're interested in any of this stuff, um, uh, yeah, feel free to uh, reach out and um, have a chat. And um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, there's uh, the project I was talking about. Um, we've reached out to, um, or people in that project team, have uh, reached out to people in the Upper North Island from different councils. Um, uh, but yeah, feel free to have a chat with me and we'll, we'll see how that shapes up going forwards. Um, yeah, and if you want to talk to anyone else that's in, been involved in any of the science, etc., that I've talked about, um, yeah, feel free to catch up. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. And some questions for you. Start from the top. Uh, low pasture persistence seems to correlate with low lying areas. Is this the result of more extreme weather events, waterlogged, or just hotter temperatures? Um, so uh, the, the places that we modelled were, um, uh, you know, for that particular project were dairy farm, uh, dairy farming areas, which typically do tend to be those sort of flatter, lower lying, um, highly fertile places. Um, yeah, so it's not extreme weather events. So the, um, the NIWA climate data that was driving that, um, yeah, the, the extremes probably aren't in there in that distribution of events so much as, you know, normal and sort of a bit better, a bit worse. So no, it wasn't driven by extremes. Um, but yeah, so that, that modelling takes into account the hotter temperatures uh, or, you know, the temperature data and it takes into account the um, uh, rainfall um, as well. So, you know, there's, there are some places that will see more rainfall and if it is reliably more rainfall, you know, there's, there could possibly be an improvement in persistence in some small areas. but. In general, it'll, it, it'll worsen. Um, have tree fodder options been explored? Potential for animal health improvements too. Um, there was a project, um, productive riparian um, buffers. Anyone um, involved with that? Um, so um, now, who was working on that? I think Manaki Fenua did a bit of work on that in conjunction with um, uh, with Dairy and Ted to look at you know okay um, is there some uh, you know where we're growing you know uh, things that aren't pasture can we get um, you know more than one benefit out of it they are um, uh, it is a little bit tricky to have enough volume that's going to be useful um, for the size of the demand of um, you know a dairy herd. You know, um, so you need you need a you know a reasonable percentage of the farm put into those things to make them useful at the scale that they're needed. Um, but yeah, there's the, you know, there's certainly some options there. Uh, seems as though trees could play a big part in resolving cow stress as well as many other issues, but not mentioned. Um, Absolutely. So where I come from, um, uh, dairy farming, about four hours north of Sydney, what we have in place is um, uh, copses of trees. And so the cows um, then have the choice of, am I going to graze or am I going to go into the trees? And it's quite interesting. There's certain temperature, temperature humidity thresholds where they'll stay out and eat, and then it gets a bit higher, then they'll alternate you know, shade and grazing, and then it gets a bit higher, and they're like, no, bugger this, I'm off to the trees. Um, so, yes, I, I didn't mention it, but it's absolutely, um, uh, I think, absolutely, I think, part of the solution. Um, uh, could the reduction in past yield be compaction, kaikuyu, or other factors other than climate? Um, yeah, well, kaikuyu um, ingress um, uh, will affect the um, usable energy that you can harvest off a farm so to some extent that will be um, you know affecting it but 
the reason Kaikuya can get in is because the uh, perennial ryegrass isn't competitive enough with the um, Kaikuya. And so the warmer temperatures and humidity favour the Kaikuya. Is a simple solution just to have dairy in the regions of NZ with cooler climate in the future? Um, uh, well, I love Southland. I'm going to be going there on holidays over Christmas. Um, uh, do we want everyone with dairy farm and cows to ship to Southland? Um, I think that's probably going to put that uh, region under a bit of uh, pressure that maybe maybe it doesn't necessarily need. But um, uh, yeah. I, uh, there's, there's no question that uh, dairy has to adapt to keep um, operating where it is now, and that's not just from a climate perspective, you know, the water quality, etc., etc. Um, but yeah, I think uh, um, uh, further to um, Cam's um, comments earlier, um, a wholesale change into um, a whole new um, uh, business land use type can actually be a lot more complicated than some people um, might suggest. So uh, our ability to you know, adapt fast enough for what's coming at us is plausibly, um, uh, yeah, plausibly the, one of the better options. Okay. Maybe you want to have a go at the second one and then is there a need finish to on that one, I think. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, is there a need to continue monitoring long-term pasture growth rates regionally in supporting our understanding of growth rate change very long term. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>